If you're listening to this podcast, it means you're hungry, hungry for change, hungry for growth, and ready to have a major breakthrough in your business. As a partner or founder in more than a dozen businesses that do more than $5 billion in revenue each year, Tony Robbins has learned from the best in the world, the Steve Wins, Mark Benioffs, and Peter Goobers, what it takes to be successful. Whether you've been in business for decades or are just getting started, it's important to get help from someone who's been there, someone who's going to coach you through it. That's why Tony is offering a free one-on-one business strategy session from one of his top business strategists, a $600 value, completely free, no strings attached. If you're listening right now, go to TonyRobbins.com slash CEO and sign up for a free session with a Tony Robbins trained business strategist who's helped business owners just like you to overcome their obstacles and set them on the path to success. In a world where 96% of businesses fail after 10 years, you must know how to anticipate and how to take advantage. Take advantage of this offer today. Hey everyone, welcome to the Tony Robbins Podcast. I'm Anna York, the editorial lead for Robbins Research International. In this special episode, we're bringing you front and center to business mastery, where Tony recently led a panel discussion with the business leaders behind some of today's fastest growing companies. Companies that are simply on fire. Companies like SoulCycle. Chances are you've either been to a SoulCycle class or you've had a friend who's raved about it because it's really taken the fitness world by storm. And one of the key players behind this new fitness phenomenon is CEO Melanie Wellen. Melanie has served as SoulCycle CEO since June of 2015. And in this very short time, she's helped take the company from seven operating locations to 70 jam-packed studios across the nation. And they're still growing exponentially. So what makes SoulCycle such a powerhouse? During this interview, which had the audience absolutely riveted the whole time, Tony and Melanie talk about SoulCycle's unique workout culture, their hiring process, and the customer experience that they've built so consciously that it's created raving fans in every single location. Melanie reveals just how they've been able to manage the rate of the company's enormous growth while still retaining its culture. She also talks about the secrets behind what makes SoulCycle stand apart from and above the rest. Let's hear the interview. Melanie, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Gosh, watching that video, I feel like we're we're brothers and sisters on a path around here. That's why I'm so thrilled to be here, finally. You really, (laughs) really amazing what you guys have created. Tell us, I know you aren't the founder, you're the CEO, but you're making it grow and scaling it. Tell us a little about the history for people of how this came about to start with the two ladies who started, what their intention was, if you would. Absolutely. So who here has been to SoulCycle? Awesome, awesome. So for those of you who have not been to SoulCycle, you've been to SoulCycle too, awesome. Big fan over here, it's so great. So what we really create in the room, and hopefully what this video shows you, is it's really an experience. When you walk into the studio, what we always wanted you to feel was that this was part of your family. You know, we're a hospitality company first, and we really get to know our riders, why they've come into the studio, what's going on in their lives, and we wanna make those genuine connections with our riders from the moment they hit the lobby door. Once you get into the actual studio, it's a candlelit space, and you have 45 minutes disconnected from technology where you're moving to the rhythm of the music. And and just as it says in the video, you push yourself further than you even knew possible because you have 55 people moving with you together. So when Julie and Elizabeth founded the company, the idea was that they had each moved to New York, one from Colorado and one from Los Angeles, and that where fitness was really part of their lifestyle. They would go either spinning or to yoga or go hiking, and they couldn't find anything in New York where they could connect with friends and have a community experience that was also fitness-based. And so they created a marketplace, basically, to wow. put the product into. You know, there was no boutique fitness when SoulCycle launched in 2006. And we always say that you know, SoulCycle needed to be created, and this entire industry was sort of born behind it, But the idea was that it was a space that was social and was joyful and it gave people a way to connect in a time where we're increasingly connected to cell phones and devices. And as much as we say we're connected more now than ever, we're actually really disconnected. And what SoulCycle does is give you that space not just to connect to each other in the lobbies, but to connect to yourself and really set an intention on those handlebars every time you walk into the studio. How do you create that? First of all, give a hand, but that's awesome. (laughs) What in order? Everyone talks about you know giving people an experience, designing an experience, but only a few companies really pull that off. And you have how many locations now? We just opened our 70s location on Friday in Seattle. Congratulations! That's awesome. (laughs) Awesome. So 
when you when you've scaled to that level, that's the secret, right? How do you do it? So I remember uh, talking originally with the gentleman who took over, he ran MTV and eventually took over uh, Six Flags. And one of the things he did at Six Flags to turn it around is he came, pulled all the employees together and said, we're gonna compete with Disneyland and everybody's rolling their eyes. Uh, but he told me the reason for doing that was first to train them. They used to be comparing themselves to the county fair, right, to raise right. pieces. But the reason I bring it up is he did this big meeting with everybody and said, we want to treat everybody like family. This is, this is going to be what the culture is about. And then he said later that day, and he's not very famous looking, right, so he's walking around checking things out, and he watches this mother who gives her son an ice cream cone, and he slams it in the ground. It's ice cream everywhere, all the concrete. And the janitor runs up and starts screaming at this mother about her, her child. And he witnesses the whole thing. His heart's beating out of him. He runs over, separates the janitor from the woman, apologizes to the woman, buys another ice cream oh cone, gosh. and then goes to the janitor and says, what are you doing? We just had this conversation about treating people like family. He goes, that's what I do with my family if they threw an ice cream down like this. <laughs> right? so, so he realized he had to be more specific to create culture and yeah. that what he had to do was at Disneyland, they have rules, I'm sure you know, cast members, right? Mm -hmm. You, When someone gets within 10 feet, you must make eye contact. Mm -hmm. When they get in five feet, you must smile. When they get from five feet to three feet, you can say one of five things. If they ask to go to the janitor or to the, tr to the bathroom, you walk them to the bathroom. So what he began to realize, I need specific rules yeah. to make that happen. Do you guys have, how do you guys create this culture in new locations with new staffs and really create the same quality of experience that you're famous for? Yeah, so it's a great question and much harder to execute than it is to actually talk about. Yes, I understand. Um, so when I started with the company, we had seven studios all in New York, wow. and we knew that we had grand ambitions for the business and where we wanted to go. And so what we did is we took a step back and we really said, what is the culture? What is it that we stand for? And we got really clear on what it is. And the sort of overarching principle, we have 10 core values, but the, the overarching philosophy is that we're a culture of yes. And we believe that there is a yes in every interaction with a colleague, with a rider, with, with anyone that you come across in your day. And then what we do is we empower our teams to make that yes happen. Yes. So if you don't get into class or you don't get the bike that you wanted, I'm going to make sure you get into that class next week, you get into the next class, you get top of the wait list, you get that bike or you get a piece of retail. We are going to make it happen for you in that moment. And when you get really clear on what your culture is and what you stand for, then you take one more step back and say, now, how do I hire for that kind of attitude? You know, we, we believe internally that you hire for attitude and aptitude, not for experience. Mm -hmm. Because we will teach you everything that you need to know about how to lead a SoulCycle class or how to run a SoulCycle check-in or how to market at SoulCycle. But what we really are looking for is someone that's got that twinkle in their eye that really wants to be the best part of someone's day, who naturally looks at the glasses half full rather than half empty, and someone who's really solution-oriented. Yes. And that's really sort of the foundation of what we have created, and then we developed in a whole university on top of it. Wow. So we have over 100 proprietary training programs in something that we call The Wheel, which is our centralized training uh, repository. It's an online social platform that we use to lead trainings all over the country. And we're adding new modules all the time. We, if we see something that we're not really sure how to solve the problem, we always say, make an SOP and create a training. And when we started, there was no training. And we have just built this one module at a time. But I think what's really important and how we've been able to scale this is we say we create freedom within a framework. So we give you the framework, and we say, here's how you lead a soul cycle class. Here's the format of the class. But then you're free to lead it however you're inspired. It's right. your playlist. It's your message. It's your time of day. It's your room. So the instructors bring a lot of creativity to what they're creating in that studio. Yes. And the operators find the yeses that they know are meaningful. What's meaningful in Seattle may be different than what's meaningful in Coral Gables. And I think by challenging and empowering our teams and enabling them to have this creativity, that's how we've been able to deliver something that's not just consistent, but also really special and connected to our riders. The finding the right people is so critical in a business like this, mm. where you're trying to give an experience by that breath and that shoulder <laughs> movement. I see that's really true. <laughs> it's always a task, I'm sure. Um, but how do you really test for that? I remember I talked with people at Southwest Airlines, and they were saying at one stage, they were getting horrible reviews on their stewards and stewardesses. And the reason was, you know, you'd see these people and they'd say, it's time to you know, buckle your seatbelt. And instead of taking other people, they'd buckle themselves up, right? <laughs> and so they came up with a technique that they told me, which is they started doing group interviews. 
And everyone was preparing to be on stage, but who they were judging was not the person speaking. They were judging the people in the audience. If you're sitting here like this or writing your own notes or not paying attention, you were not picked. So the person who's nodding, shaking, supporting their competition was the one they hired, and they eliminate virtually all challenges. From a pragmatic perspective, what filters do you use to know you've got that person who's the right person in the right seat to continue yeah. your culture? Yes, we do two things, I would say. One, we run all behavioral interviews. So we ask a lot of questions having nothing to do with soul cycle. So uh, tell me about the worst day that you had at work and the best day you had at work. And then we see how they answer that question. Do they lead with the positive or do they lead with the negative? And then how do they close it out and do they frame it as an opportunity or a learning experience or something they're completely dejected about? And we have a whole series of questions that we ask that really just try to help us understand how someone thinks. Um, and then I think the, uh, the other thing that we do is we run shadow shifts. So we bring people in. You know, people think that they want to work at SoulCycle because they're writers and they love it, but it's a lot of work on the back end. And we want to make sure, I always say to people, if this is your special place, you might not want to be on the other side of the desk. You might want to keep this as your special place. Yes. So we bring them in for a shift and we watch how they vibe with the team. Do they run into the trouble or do they run away from the trouble? Because there's a lot that's coming at you when you've got 60 people coming in and 60 people coming out and everyone wants shoes and water and retail. Do you run into that fire or do you run away? So right. I think the combination of the, the qualitative and then putting them into the circumstances. Yes. You know, so we're, we're making it work so far. Well, you're certainly hard with the expansion that you've done. So you've gone from 7 to 70. Is that one yes. on, on your watch? Give her a hand for that. That's spectacular. <laughs> really spectacular. In, uh, the company was sold to... Uh, which company was it? I'm Equinox. Sorry. Yeah, Equ Equinox, made the, Equinox made the purchase. The founders made, I heard, $90 million each. It was pretty amazing. They, did they run the company for five years before they sold us? Tell us a little bit about the transaction, how that came about, if you can. So, um, so I met Julian Elizabeth back in 2008, okay. um, back at West 72nd Street. I'm going where you want me to go. Trust me here. No worries. Um, and then two years after that, um, so, and I worked at Equinox at the time. Oh, you did? And I, I have this rule in my life, if I hear about something three times from three different people, you have to go and try it. And I heard about SoulCycle once, twice, three, 16,000 times, and I finally went to try it. And I met them at 72nd Street, and I just fell in love. I fell wow. in love with the experience. I fell in love with each of them. Um, the day after I got back to my desk at Equinox, and they had mes I was uh, six months pregnant with my first child, they had messengered me a onesie with a handwritten note, thank you for coming in. There was no ask. There was no come back. There was no here's an offer. It was just a thank you. And it was so beautiful, and it was so... Um, deeply uh, authentic and unique. Yes. yes. Um, and I remember saying, we got we to figure out a way to work with these guys. This is amazing. This is so cool. And at the time, I think there were only four or five studios. So fast forward to 2010, um, and we ended up um, entering a partnership with Julian Elizabeth when I was at Equinox, and um, we invested in the business, and it was a strategic partnership. Um, we are now still completely, entirely independently run, um, but they are majority, majority owners. Um, and Julian Elizabeth ran the company for, for a couple of years before Equinox bought the remaining uh, share of the business and continues to be our partner and investor as we continue to scale. That's wonderful. There's a, people that go, I have not been, quite honestly, um, but I'm ready to sell my Peloton after watching that video. If that's how it works here. <laughs> I can um, help you with that. Uh, you can help me with that. <laughs> um, the people go tell me that it's like a tribe. That's the word I've heard used most often. Tell me, what is, what is the goal? Is there, what is the metaphor or group of metaphors? I see warrior, I see legend, I see rock star. You know, aspirational is really huge. Tell us a little bit about what people experience and what identity they get from being a part of Soul Cycle, if yeah. possible. And, and is that part, uh, conscious effort, I would assume, but I don't want to assume anything I want to ask. <laughs> so underneath all of this, we say we're in the business of personal transformation. The bike is merely... The business you're really in. The, exactly. Yeah, got it. The bike is the vessel to create the change. Got and it. so what people come to us for the fitness, and I, I say this on the video, they come for the fitness, but they stay for the breakthrough they have on the bike. What we create in 45 minutes with no technology, with someone in front of you, pushing you harder, inspiring you, and giving you messaging, saying you can do better tomorrow than you did yesterday. You can be stronger in your life, or you can push through this hill and the change comes through the transition. All of those sort of coaching moments are then applied to your life when you walk out the door. And that, that's kind of the idea is that we use the bike to create the change, to give you the power to view yourself in a different way when you leave the studio. What that creates is an, an addictive, connected experience. Yes. Because you go through that with 55 other people, and then you come out into the lobby, and for those of you who have been to our 
studios. I, you know, I would love to have a 10-foot radius to, to actually make eye contact with someone. I've got about two feet radius in my <laughs> lobbies. You come out, and you're all there together, and you've gone through this collective physical, emotional, and musical experience. I mean, watching this happen, this is exactly what goes on on a micro scale in our studios. You're hearing thumping music, and everyone's excited, and you're hearing you're stronger than you thought that you were, and then you come out together, and you celebrate that moment. Well, you're coming back the next day and the next day after that because where are you getting an experience like that yeah. in your day-to-day -day life? Yeah. So that's really, I think, where the tribe comes from. That's really cool. Why? I know this is a rhetorical, que rhetorical question to some extent, but I like your opinion. Why don't more people copy what you do when you're this successful? I know there's been a few, but there aren't <laughs> a lot. Most of them are still running it. What, what's the difference? Why don't people take up hard? And what really separates you? I, I've heard several ways, but what in your mind, what separates you from all the other type of spinning classes a person could go to? Yeah, there have been a lot of copycats all over the world. It's fascinating what people are willing to knock off and call their own. Yes. Um, I, I truly believe what separates us is our people and the way that we invest in our teams. So I think we hire the greatest people. I think we retain them because we invest in them. We train them. We give them the skills to be successful, not just in the role that they're in today, but you know, with a high-gross company, we're always pushing people into jobs before they're ready. We yeah. relocate them to a new market. We promote them to run a market, um, to run more studios, to come into our HQ office and do a new job. It's so inspiring when we're mission-driven and also giving people so much opportunity for growth within the company. And I think by investing so much in our teams, you know, our retention rate is you know, well north of 90%. And so we are creating these authentic connections in the communities and I don't think other companies necessarily have, have, have done that. Yeah, 90% retention. That's quite extraordinary. To say the least, quite extraordinary. Give me What has been, uh, I mean, there's been a massive growth on your watch. What has been one or two of the biggest challenges you faced, and how did you turn them around? What would stand out for you? <laughs> oh. Oh. Um, <laughs> I think probably if I could tell one story. So the way, the way our business works is, uh, we release all of our weekly reservations Monday at noon, and it's our, our sign-ups period, and our, our whole week goes live. And over 30% of our weekly reservations are booked within the first 15 minutes. So it's a very frenetic time. We've got a lot of people pounding our servers. And we decided to rebuild and relaunch our website back in 2013, I think. And we definitely weren't ready, and we definitely should not have switched over. And we launched it, and the whole thing crashed. And what was great about that moment was the entire company knew that this was a huge priority for us. Uh, we were much smaller at the time. We had, we had probably only 100 and some people in our HQ office. But because everybody was clear that this was the highest priority, everybody piled on to make it okay. So if you think about it, we've got all these people that are trying to book their bikes, and they can't book their bikes, and they're frozen out. So our whole HQ office became a customer service center. Wow. So we're all calling riders. We'll get you in for your class. Don't worry. I've got you top of the wait list. Well, we're going to figure this out for you. And it was really cool to see the whole company come together and figure it out and find the yes, right? We're a culture of yes. We all found the yes. They were long nights. <laughs> yes. It was a long, long weeks. But... I think what it taught us in that moment was be clear on your intention with the company, be transparent with your goal, because then when things don't go right, everyone sort of piles on to help because they're aligned with the vision and where you're going. Yep. Um, I have tons of stories of, of challenges we've faced, which I think is just the nature of a high growth business. But that was one of the uh, more challenging times, I would say, was booking 10,000 people manually in our HQ office. I can only imagine. <laughs> How, what are you most proud of that you've accomplished thus far? I can tell you that we never dreamed the business was going to be this big. Wow. When we started the partnership and uh, when I got involved with the founders, I, you know, I think we thought we could maybe have 25 studios by 2015. We thought maybe it would work in New York, Los Angeles, and, and maybe San Francisco. To be sitting here today with 14 markets, 70 studios, 2,000 people, and seeing over 4 million people a year and the change that we're creating in their lives is so rewarding and so exciting. We've got so much more to do. It's beautiful. Three questions just for her, then we'll bring in our next contestant. We'll do the same form. At the end, we'll have all three of them here, the contestants. Contested. Questions? Yes. Um, I have a question. I have a Peloton bike. And in my town, we don't have your we don't have your facility, but we do have something called Cycle Bar, and that's compared to what I saw in your studio inside. Yours seems to be more raw, and like people aren't afraid to sweat. 
And the cycle bar, like, I didn't even want to go in there and, like, sweat. I was embarrassed if I was sweating. It's real clean. It's high end. Yours seems to be very different. Do you try to keep that raw, real functional atmosphere in all your locations? So, first of all, where do you live? In Texas. Te- where in Texas? Lubbock, Texas. Okay. We'll talk afterward. We, we've got to find a place to <laughs> I'll open a soul cycle what? studio. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think what, what we... <laughs> More people in Lubbock, Texas? Amazing. Yay! <laughs> How many Texans out there? <laughs> All right. So we are in Dallas, Houston, and Austin. Not Lubbock yet, but we will, we will get there. Awesome. Yeah, I'm from San Antonio, too, so we'll talk. <laughs> oh, good. What we really try to create, honestly, is sort of this environment of hospitality. We really want to know wh- how you came into SoulCycle, what you're looking to accomplish, what's going on in your life, and we want to know how your experience is when you come out the other side of the class. And we really want to make that connection. And whether that reads as raw or honest or authentic, it's just really real. I mean, I think one of the other reasons we've been successful is we treat our employees, you know, we're customers first internally. We all use the product. Riding is a huge part of our culture. We encourage everyone to send feedback when they're taking a new class, trying a new instructor, going into a new market. We have a really transparent dialogue around all of the teams of what's working, what's not working, so that we can all get to the collective right answer. And I think what that does is breed the sort of great energy where we're so connected internally, we really want to connect with our riders as well and build those relationships one, one rider at a time. You know, I think a lot of the, whether it's Peloton or, or Cycle Bar, I actually just tried a Cycle Bar class um, over Thanksgiving, a lot of the competitors are um, technology driven. You know, they're showing you your statistics, you're competing against each other, and that, that's great because for some people, that actually is what motivates them to work out. We are in the business of motivation in a very different way. You know, right. we believe the collective good is more important than your individual success and that the collective energy is going to drive you harder individually. And so that, that really, that feeling of collective energy and individual relationship is what sets us apart. I could see that in your video, so that was really great. So thank thank you. you. Another question. How about, uh, yes, ma'am, right here. Hi, I'm Lala from Australia. <gasps> <Yes>. <laughs> My question to you is like you go into that emotional like um, going into that thing, but how do you maintain it that that emotional like you know some people like they go ups and down mm-hmm. right so how do you maintain and that that sustainability on that being into that level of like you know that that they want to, they want to go next the next day and all that because some people they go ups and down absolutely but for me the key thing is that sustainability yeah so of course like you have like your fees and all that of course sometimes they go through that as well that oh how can i maintain to 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 be a member all that so how do you do that sustainability so One of the ways that we've done this, in the beginning, when the company was founded, Julie and Elizabeth had $2,000 left when they built out the first studio. And they decided rather than taking out an ad in a paper or a magazine, they would produce a line of t-shirts with the wheel and the brand on it. And they thought if people would just buy the t-shirts and wear the t-shirts, that would be the best marketing for the business. And what that has become is an, an apparel business that is sort of a business in its own right to the side where once you have this great experience, and it's not unlike Disney, you, know, you, you come through the gift shop, you're high on endorphins, you pull a piece of the brand and you take it with you. And it's a sort of constant reminder as you're wearing your sweatshirt or your sweatpants out in your life of that feeling that you got in the room. There is no doubt that some days you come into SoulCycle because you just want to work out, you want to get your butt kicked, and you want to go. It's not about emotional connection or spirituality. It's just about a great workout. And maybe you're not feeling as connected to yourself or to us that day. There are lots of other days where, again, just putting the, the simplicity of putting your phone away and not having any distractions but yourself and this challenge and this connection with your community is so rare that that really ultimately is what's sustaining people and their connectivity. But whether it's our retail or our front desk teams and how they're getting to know our riders, there's lots of other ways that we try to sustain it in between those classes. One more. Yes, sir, the red shirt in the back there. Yes, sir, right here, yes. Thank you for sharing, by the way, and also uh, my name's Tony Tucci. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. 2018. Um, My question is, what... I, I also have a gym. It's boutique-style gym. Um, 
we have nine different programs under one uh, kind of house, and uh, we have roughly about 4,000 members. And what was the hardest, what is your pain points of franchising? So we don't franchise. We're all company owned and operated. And we, okay. made, we made that decision, frankly, because we're in the experience business. And we felt like that was something that we needed to control um, and oversee as we've scaled as quickly as we have. Thank you. Sure. One last question. Yes, right here in the front row. Hi, my name's Paul, also from Australia. <gasps> this is so cool. Every time myself and my wife come to America, and it's probably 12, 15 times a year, we always go to your soul cycle. Thank you. One thing I notice, though, is the crowd is predominantly women. And often when I go... How did you notice that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a man. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> No, but, but my question is then, you know, I like to go to the gym and when I go and do your soul cycle, maybe guys don't realise, you, you do the bicycle but then you, you do your weights, little part of it also. And it's funny, when you pick up that five kilo weight by the time you're absolutely exhausted, you're ringing wet, it feels like about 100 kilos. <laughs> but is that a market that, is that just developed that way or is it a market that you're, is, a, is the marketing push to get more men or is it a, predominantly female by default or because as a guy it's pretty awesome but I just wonder why there isn't more there or is it a marketing thing or is it a yeah when well, you will be the face of our new campaign obviously <laughs> thank you okay <laughs> because it is something a pro a, not a problem an opportunity we have been trying to solve for the last couple of years right. so we don't market to anyone anything Right. This is all about a psychographic and a type of person that is looking for connectivity and personal transformation. 80% of the new riders that come in come through word of mouth, through a friend. Every time I'm in the lobby and I ask, how'd you hear about SoulCycle? It's always, my friend dragged me, my friend dragged me, my friend dragged me. Yeah, my me. wife. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, the, the other thing is, if you go to our different studios, um, depending on time of day. So I live in downtown New York. If I go into our studios for the 6 and 7 a.m. classes, we call those our rooster classes because those are people that want to get up. They want to get it in. They're hard charging. They're going to work. That's probably 50, 50 male, female. Right. 8.30, 9.30, 10 30 in the morning. If you're coming for vacation, maybe that's when you're riding. That yeah. may be a little bit more female. And the yeah. evening, you know, especially in our urban markets, is usually a little more 60, 40 female, male. So it really ranges by time of day and market that we're in. Um, but there's something about group exercise that is always skewed a little more female. Yeah. But what we find is once we hook the men, they're hooked. Yeah, I love it. Thank <laughs> you. Give me a hand. The Tony Robbins Podcast is directed and hosted by Tony Robbins and Mary Buckheit. Annie Org is our editorial director and occasional host. The podcast is produced by Carrie Song and Tyler Culbertson. Jamie Carvajal and Adriel De La Torre are our digital editors. Special thanks to Diane Adcock for her creative review. Copyright Robbins Research International.